All right, let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. I pray for the school. I pray that we honor you and glorify you. I pray that we come to a time of worship and just focusing on you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this weather. In Jesus' name, amen. you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you there's none like you our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer awesome and power may be seated. Good morning, guys. How you doing? Doing good, chilling, relaxing, having a good day. That's awesome. My name is Dylan Webb. 
I oversee student ministries at Faith Community Church. We have a few Faith Community Church representatives in here. Whoop, 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 whoop. Um, I am married to my beautiful wife, Peyton Webb. She works at Legacy. Trader. Ooh. SCCS is rad. I'm super stoked to be here with you guys today. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the time that we get together today to look at your word. Lord, please speak uh, mightily through me and help me to communicate this clearly, Lord, and truthfully. We pray this in your name. Amen. So our text today, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to 1 Samuel chapter 8. And if you guys, we have a few sermon title folks in the house. If you want to put a title to the sermon, it's Baby Step to backslide, baby step, talking about just a little tiny step to a backslide, completely going the opposite direction that it should be going. Baby step to backslide, 1 Samuel chapter 8. We're going to do the whole chapter. Now, by show of hands, how many Finding Nemo uh, supporters do we have in the house? Come on, come on. I know you guys are in high school, but no one is too old for Finding Nemo. Some of you guys are like, I watched it last night. It's the best movie ever. Finding Nemo. Do you guys remember the scene when Nemo swims out to the boat, or they call it the butt in the movie. He swims out to the boat, and his, Nemo's dad's like, don't touch the boat. And then Nemo's like, oh, really? Boom, slaps the boat. Next thing he does is slap the boat. He did not heed his dad's authority. He didn't heed heed his dad's request. And the rest of the movie, that's kind of the starting point of the downward spiral because he hits the boat and the diver jumps in the water and and the Nemo gets, uh, you know, captured by by the diver guy. And then the rest of the movie is Nemo's dad is trying to find Nemo. But it all started when Nemo did one touch to the boat. It was a baby step. And then it backslid, and the rest of the movie is just them trying to figure out the problem starting at this point. Likewise, in our passage today, we're going to see something very similar. And our big idea, if you guys remember nothing else from this message today, remember this. Write this down. Rebellion to God's reign to look like the world is the first step of a catastrophic backslide. One more time. Rebellion to God's reign to look like the world is the first step of a catastrophic backslide, just like Nemo. The first step, he hit the boat, and next thing you know, he's like in uh, an aquarium somewhere at a dentist's office or something like that. Same thing with Israel. We're going to see that they took one step and then it continued to downward spiral and it doesn't end well. Now, before we jump into our text, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of background. How did we get to 1 Samuel chapter chapter 8? How did we land in this passage today? So 1 Samuel is right at the end. The, the time frame is right at the end of the book of Judges. And if you guys have read the book of Judges, it's not a good book because they continually do a downward spiral and they rebel against God and they rebel against God and they rebel. And then basically Samson, you guys think about the, the dude that's like super buff. He's probably not actually buff, but he's super strong. And then Samson's the last judge, but actually Samuel, the book that first Samuel or the uh, the book that first Samuel is named after, this Samuel is actually the last judge of Israel. Now, before we get to chapter eight. Israel is not looking so hot. Israel's having lots of problems. In, in the first part of 1 Samuel, basically what we see is that they get absolutely whooped by the Philistines, this other nation. And then the Israelites are like, We're, let's take the Ark of the Covenant out and let's try and see if that gets us a victory. It doesn't. So the Ark of the Covenant, which represents God's presence, is now it goes on like this wagon ride, and then it keeps going to these different Philistine places, and they're like, get that thing away from me. It's making all these problems. Get it out of here. And then the ark comes back to Israel, but, 
And then there's like a little bit of repentance in chapter 8. But then we land, or in chapter 7, and then we land in chapter 8, and we actually see that Israel is still a hot mess. Nothing good is going on for the nation of Israel. So the first part of our text, if you guys are taking notes, I'm calling it Israel's Fresh Request. But not fresh with an F. we got to do PH fresh, am I right? Israel's Fresh Request, verses 1 through 6. So let's look at verse 4. Read it with me. Or don't read it with me. I'll read it for you. Verse 4, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And he said to them, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Did you catch that last phrase? Like all the nations. Now, look at verse 6. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. So what's going on here? What is Israel's fresh request or fresh idea, whatever you want to call it? Israel's idea is for Samuel, this uh, last judge and also a prophet, to appoint for Israel a human king so that they look like the other nations. So all the nations that are surrounding Israel, they have human kings, right? So Israel, they're having kind of a, a mess. Samuel's sons aren't awesome like Samuel. They're taking bribes. And they're not following the Lord. Israel is a mess, so they come together and like, Samuel, give me a human king. Give me a human king. Now, the key phrase that I highlighted to you guys is like all the nations. So this gives us insight to the actual request that Israel is making. Like all the nations. Israel is not supposed to look like all of the other nations. In fact, they're supposed to be holy and separate and have nothing to do with all the other nations. Go back to this verse uh, in, in your own time. I'll uh, write it down though. Leviticus 20, 26. Leviticus 20, 26. And this is throughout all of the Old Testament, by the way. But just this reference I'm going to read for you guys. You shall be holy to me. So this is God saying to the people of Israel. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from, I lost my place, where'd it go? Separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. So what is God saying? He's saying that you should be holy like I'm holy. You shouldn't look like the other nations. You should have nothing to do with them. You are supposed to be completely separate. So when you're saying, anoint for me a king so I look like the other nations, that's a big problem. That's Israel's problem of rebelling against God. If you look all the way through the Old Testament, tracing up to this point, I mean, this started in Genesis with Abraham. And when God says, I'm going to make a nation from you, So God picks a nation. He picks a people separate for him. He says, you are mine. And then you get to the book of Exodus, and he takes all of his people, God's people that are supposed to be separate, he takes them out of Egypt, and he brings them to the wilderness and to the promised land. Why? Because they're supposed to be separate and holy, and they're supposed to be God's people. And then you get to to like Leviticus, have you guys, you guys ever tried to do the Bible through your plan? Usually you guys like get to Leviticus and you're like, what is he talking about? What am I supposed to do with these birds? It's what all this is about is all these specific laws so that Israel does not look like the other nations and they need to obey so that they are able to have a relationship with God. Once again, they're supposed to look like the other nations. That's reflected in the whole entire law. And then you get to the conquests of Joshua when they're wiping out all of these nations. Why is that important? Why, is, why are the people in Joshua wiping out the nations? That's because they, the other nations are not following God. They are not God's people. And they're inhabiting the land that God's people are supposed to be living in. So all of the context leading up to this point is God setting apart a people for himself, and they are not supposed to look like the other nations. So when you get to this phrase, you get to the phrase, uh, we want to look like the other nations. 
There's lots of weight. There's a big problem here. It shows their rebellion. So you get there, and they're, and they're saying to Samuel, I want to look like them. Red flags should be going up. You guys should be like, what are you talking about? God chose us. God picked us, and we don't want to follow God? Oh, my goodness, we want to look like the other nations who are not following God at all? Red flags should be flying up for you guys. Don't do it, Israel. That's a bad idea. Now, what does God say? So this next part is God's response, verses 7 through 18. God's response, verses 7 through 18. Look down at verse 7. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you. So God's saying, Samuel, give them a king. If they want a king, obey it, give it to them. For they have not rejected you, they have not rejected you, Samuel, but they have rejected me from being king over them. This is a crushing verse that you should sit on and think about, that they are rejecting God's reign as their king. They're saying, I don't want God to reign over us. We want somebody else. They rejected God by this request. So the solution to Israel's problems isn't give us a king who, a human king. It's actually, hey, Israel, you need to start following God with everything that you have. You need to start obeying the covenant. Jump down to verse 9. Now then, so this is God saying to Samuel, now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the, way, the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel is told to warn Israel. This is God's grace and mercy overflowing. Israel rebels and says, I want somebody other than you, God. I want a human king. And God says, okay, give it to them. But Give them this warning. There is going to be consequences to this request. If I give this to you, there are going to be repercussions. And how about you let them know and give them another opportunity? Praise the Lord that he gave them another opportunity. Now look at the warnings of what a human king would be like. Look at verse, verses 11 through 18. It's kind of a big chunk of scripture, but it's important to read, so I'm going to read the whole section of it. Look at verse 11. He said, there will be, uh, yeah, he said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. So basically, this human king, he's going to take your sons and he's going to put them in war. Verse 12, and he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make uh, his implements of war, which are just weapons, and the equipment of his chariots. So he's going to put your people to hard labor. Look at verse 13. He will take your daughters to be perfumers or perfume makers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and the vineyards and olive orchards, and he will give them to his servants. So he's going to take your daughters and put them to work. He's going to take the best of what you have from your crops and from what you do for your job. He's going to take the best of it. And he's going to take it for himself, and he's going to distribute it as he pleases. Verse 15, he will take a tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers and his servants. He will take your male servants and your female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. This is the nature of a human king, oppressive. He's going, basically, Israel, if you do this, you are going to be slaves to this king. He's going to be oppressive. He's going to take the best of what you got. There's going to be taxes. He's going to take uh, your sons and daughters and put them into war. And look down at verse 18. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. 
So the rule of a human king is going to be oppressive, selfish, and will result with them and slavery. If I can put an umbrella term over a human king, if there's an umbrella term for this list, and, and this list could be greatly expanded, it's one word, it's sinful. It's sinful. Israel is saying, I don't want a holy, sinless, perfect God to reign over us anymore. Give me a human, sinful king. I don't want God to be our king. I want a sinful human king. This is like the scene in, uh, in, in Star Wars. We have some Star Wars fans in the house. Yeah, we got some Star Wars fans. This is like when Anakin is like about to go to the dark side and you're sitting there and you're like, don't do it, man. Don't become Darth Vader. What are you doing? Stay on the good side. Stay on the winning team. Stay on the winning team. Don't do it, Anakin. Israel's second chance. So look down at verses 19 through 22. What does Israel have to say to all of these warnings? What does Israel have to say to Samuel and ultimately to God who just gave them another opportunity? Look at verse 19. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. Verse 20. That we also may be like all the nations. Boom. There's that phrase again. And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. 21. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. So they said, I don't want God to be our king. I want a human king. Despite all the warnings that you gave us, appoint for us a king still. Now, in youth group at Faith Community Church, we're looking through the time of Israel's kings. So you could say Ruth through uh, Second Kings, or you could even say Second Chronicles. Now, the end of the story if you stop at, at 2 Kings, it ends with Israel being taken captive and being sent off to another nation. In fact, what happens is a, a human king gets anointed and another one gets anointed and another one comes through and another one comes through and another one comes through and they're all sinful human kings. None of them measure up to God. Not one of them. And if you read all the way through, it ends not on a high note. Israel does not end on a high note at 2 Kings. It ends on a low note, being sent off to a land and a nation that is not their own. Now, this all started, the story starts here. But it starts as a baby step. Can't you see that they didn't, like, go to God with pitchforks and, like, you know, throw torches at him. No, they were like, how, I have an idea. How about you do this? It wasn't full-fledged rebellion necessarily. It started as a baby step, an idea. And then where does it end? It ends with Israel in exile. It doesn't end well. And it all started at the baby step. It's like Nemo hitting the boat. It all started there. And then where does Nemo end up? He ends In a land that's not his own, he ends in a fish tank in a dentist's office from the great big ocean. Same exact thing, and it all starts with a baby step. Can you guys see it? It's the same thing for us today. The story is no different. If we are God's children, if we belong to God, if we've been reconciled to God, we have been set apart and adopted into the family of Christ. Set apart. We are not of this world, even though we live in this world. Meaning that 
the people who belong to Christ should not look like the other people in this world who are not following Christ. They should be set apart. To use the language of 1 Samuel, they should not look like the other nations. Why? Because they are God's people. However, disobedience to God's reign, God's reign in your own life, in our own lives, the king of our heart, you could say, this disobedience, this sin in our lives usually starts with baby steps. Soon you can no longer tell an unbeliever from a Christian. Soon Christians, when they start on this path of not following Christ, not letting Christ reign in our lives, not submitting to Christ and what he's communicated to us in the word, soon they start to look like the other nations. Soon you can't tell them apart. They're in complete rebellion. Now, I have an encouragement for you guys. For those who are following Christ, keep fleeing sin and run to Christ. Keep fleeing it. If sin's there, get away from me, dude. Get away. I want nothing to do with this sin. Be like Joseph in in the book of Genesis. When there's sin at his face, he literally sprints away from the opportunity to sin. Flee sin with everything that you have and run to Christ. Follow Christ. Submit to Christ. Christ is king. Follow him. I also have a call to action to some of you. There's probably people in this room that have lives that look like the world. I'm not a prophet, I'm nothing special, but I was in high school once, and I remember what that was like. There are people in this room that are probably not following Christ with everything they have. Or you could say, sin is your king. Christ is not the king in your life. You're not submitted to Christ. You're submitted to sin. I challenge you to draw to Christ in repentance. Draw to him. Submit your life to Christ with all you have. Give him everything. It doesn't matter how deep you are in sin or how far you are in sin. Christ's grace can cover all of it through the power of the cross. Don't limit God's grace on the cross. It can reach you too, 100% through and through. Jesus' restorative work in our lives comes about when we draw to him in repentance and say, I'm not going to live this life anymore. And you submit to him with everything that you have. And I'm going to finish with this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes on this whole planet. It's by Richard Sibbs. He says, there is more grace in Christ than sin in us. The reaches of God's grace, the amount of God's grace, the abundance of God's grace far exceeds all of the sin that we could accrue in our lives. That applies to each and every one of us in this room. So draw to Christ in repentance. Place your faith in him and submit to him as your king. I'm going to finish with the big idea. Rebellion to God's reign to look like the world is the first step of a catastrophic backslide. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the example of Israel. Lord, their rebellion to you starts as a baby step, but Lord, we're able to look in our day, in our age, we're able to look back at that and take it and say, that's not the way to go. Lord, we know the end of that story, and it's not good. It ends in exile, ends in sin, and sin expanding. Lord, I just ask that if there's students in this room that have not submitted to you as as their king, they're living in sin, that haven't placed their faith in you, haven't repented, Lord, that you would awaken their heart. Lord, please place a burden on them. Lord, don't let them sleep tonight 
without them reconciling this and figuring this out, Lord, with you and ultimately drawing to you. And Lord, for the students who are following you with all that they have, Lord, give them the strength to continue to flee sin. Lord, they don't flirt with it. They don't touch it. They don't get anywhere close to it, Lord, that they run away from it with everything that they have. Lord, we pray this in your holy name. Amen.